गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गना शॉर्ट गना शॉर्ट में आप सबका स्वागत है वनकम प्रणाम एंड जय हिंद टूडे वी गोन टॉक अबाउट द एंड ऑफ चाइना हंड्रेड ईयर मैराथन द फोर्थ पार्ट वेर वी विल डिस्कस क्लाइमेट चेंज एंड टू डिस्कस दिस टॉपिक आई हैव विद मी मिस्टर श्री अयर ऑल द वे फ्रॉम कैलिफोर्निया Good evening, Mr. Shri Iyer. Welcome to our joint program. Namaskar, General Sir. It's always a pleasure and honor to be invited to talk about climate change. Looking forward to a very fruitful and in-depth discussion, Sir. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I, what 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 I'm going to uh, put across is a few issues. You see, climate change, as we know, is going to affect all of us. So, what is different about China? That's the issue which we have to see. uh climate change we have a problem in india also about climate change but that's not the issue the issue we are going to today talk is about china its power structure and it is ability and its gross national power that's the thing we are not looking at china in comparison to others that's the first thing and secondly what i'd request all viewers is not to take this presentation in isolation this has to be seen as part of the Uh, rest of the whole thing so this is the basic thing so before i start uh, this business about climate change and you know the 100 year marathon of china what are your initial views about it how do you think this is going to pan out or how do you think this is happening um general ravishankar thank you so much and and viewers i used to travel to china when uh, as part of a startup where we had to do a lot of manufacturing there and to tell you honestly my first impressions this is in the early 2000s and and my first impressions were you know scary because uh, we used to you know uh, in those days most of the manufacturing was very close to hong kong you cross the thing you get to mainland shenzhen and then some of the uh, cities just north of that that's where most of the activity was even then i'm talking 2001 the sun never came out general ravi shankar all i saw was haze and smoke never even after a one hour downpour there will be no sun this was my first impressions plus there was always this smell of you know burning wood or something like that all the time all the time and this is 20 years ago and i can only imagine how things have gone bad from there i really look forward to why you think things went so bad and how china is going to correct itself okay right uh so well let's start you know the why this 100 year marathon for all of you who have not seen this series earlier this 100 year marathon was the book by michael pillsbury and he said that you know china has a secret strategy to replace america as the global superpower and to my mind it's not happening that's why i said it's the end of the 100 year marathon now when you look at the power structure of a country it the it comprises of many issues but what i picked up was these six factors which are there on the view foil we have already discussed demography ideology and the economic structural issues and today we are going to hit the climate change but then to recap the first part was of demography and i had said that you know a nation is made of uh, people the one child policy has been absolutely lousy for china its population is uh, dwindling abysmal birth rates working age population are being lost and china is aging at the fastest rate in human history and these were the graphs which i quoted un based graphs and based on this you see that while till 2030 there's no appreciable change in the chinese population it won't be very appreciable but one fourth of the population would have been aged 160 plus group but the real things the slide down slide starts are uh, in the uh, decade 2030 to 40 where the popular total population decreases by 55% working population redu- reduces by 12% 120 million that's big and one third of the population will be aged and then of course there is ideology this communist ideology is not going anywhere communism is the bedrock of prc while china grew astronomically in the mao era the people felt the ccp felt it was losing control and there was a hint of loss of power 
And that is why Xi Jinping was charged by the CCP to restore the party primacy. And once Xi came into power, there are no reforms. All reforms have been reversed. Purges are on. All alternate centers of power have been eradicated. And political power trumps economy. And increasingly, security laws are being given more importance. And consolidation of power will continue. And then we have to understand, communism is the antithesis of capitalism. There's no case in history where a communist government or a communist system has succeeded economically. And the leadership in China, including Xi Jinping, are willing to sacrifice economic growth for the sake of ideology. And then last week, we spoke about the economic structure and we discussed all these points and we saw that investment is down and exports are down, manufacturing is down. And they're looking at consumption and commodities. I mean, they're looking at consumption to bail them out, which they can't. And they do. And uh, China doesn't have any commodity of value to even export. And then, of course, the cycle, which I explained, Z started with the anti-corruption thing, BRI, doubling of the economy by 2035. Then he came out with the Z thought and dual circulation and the made in China. All these are failing. All these are failing. Then he's gone on to the state control where he jettisoned Deng Xiaoping's ideas and, you know, just embraced Maoism. And he spoke of common prosperity. No one knows what it is. He looks at uh, SOEs. And he's broken the edtech, fintech, and the property sector. Today he talks of security and technology. But then when the economy is tanking, he's looking at privatization. He's, the problem is food security and coal-based energy, which is not there. So we'll talk about all that today. And like I said, we're going to talk of climate change today. For all of you who are seeing this channel for the first time, please subscribe to Ganashot. And simultaneously, please also subscribe to Pgurus because this is a joint program between both of us. OK, why climate change? This is a very interesting triarchy. You know, if you look at the history of China, droughts, and floods have been endemic to China from times immemorial. Many Chinese dynasties have collapsed due to drought, finance, famines, and floods. Last year, not this year, last year, there was a huge drought. It was more extensive and severe than in the past 150 years. This year's floods have been devastating. So if you look at it, climate changing change is affecting their water flood, food, energy, and this, and as a result, their semiconductor programs. This is the, uh, you know, South China Morning Post uh, headline of 2022, where he talks of record heat wave and worst drought in decades in the summer of 22. One year is a long time, but just think, one year back, they had a drought, which was the highest in the recorded history of China. Okay, and that drought has impacted food and factory production, power supplies, and transport in vast areas of the country. The Yangtze River Basin, which you know is from Shanghai right to Sichuan, right, and it is Asia's longest river, was considered the worst affected area. Some of the major lakes in that area got dried out, and hundreds of millions of people were impacted, right? That's what this also says. Experts say the heat wave could be among the worst recorded in global history. Okay, so it's been one extreme in China last year. And what is it this year? This year, what can the headline says, what can China learn from worst flooding in 140 years? Complete extreme, complete turnaround. And this is the effect of uh, climate change on China. Right? In a place where historically there have been problems of climate change, where, you know, uh, emperors have been and empires have just fallen off because of floods and famines. To the extent Xi Jinping went around, you know, there were a whole lot of tycoons this year, earlier this year in the rainy season and where crops got damaged. And Xi Jinping ran towards all these places to see whether things are okay or not, and to make his presence felt. Because China is a food insecure nation.
China does not grow the amount of food it needs. And then look at this. More people are living in flood-prone areas despite risk from climate change with biggest increase in China. This is an international study. So people are at risk in China. And people are not prepared to move away from those flood-prone areas in China because, paradoxically, the flood-prone areas are also the most fertile areas in China. They can't go away. And the most productive areas. Okay. What's the problem of China? Expanding desertification, shrinking of arable land, and water shortages have increased as China has developed. This is very significant, which we'll touch upon later. Food insecurity has dominated national deba debate as unpredictable weather has adversely affected crops repeatedly. In this last one year, their major wheat crops have been damaged to the tune of up to 30 to 40 percent. 30 to 40 percent of the wheat production in uh, China has been damaged. And they have a problem if this continues and one day Malacca Strait gets blocked, they are finished. Unprecedented floods and droughts in the past few years have increased this damage. Okay. And climate change casts a dark shadow on China's energy security. This is important because energy security affects their manufacturing or energy insecurity affects their manufacturing and their industrialization. You look at this. These are the two main rivers, Yangtze River and Yellow River on the top. The Yellow River is the is something like Brahmaputra. It goes through large flood plains and it changes course with every flood season. So, and it you know kills people. It used to be called the sorrow of China. The Yellow River was called the sorrow of China, Huangi, the sorrow of China. So, what did the Chinese do? The Chinese dammed it. They diked it, they built, you know, they trained, tamed this river by having embankments and all that. But the alluvial plains and the soil which it brought down from the mountains has raised the bed of the river itself beyond the uh, thing. So the floods have increased. Instead so, of so they were not, they were not doing desilting, sir. They were not doing desilting. No, they can't do desilting on this so, kind of a river. You can, can you do? I mean, just give you an equivalent for those people who are watching from USA especially or even for that matter from India. Can you do desilting of Ganga? Can you do desilting of Mississippi or Missouri? Unimaginable. These are navigable rivers. Right? So as a result they are in a bigger problem than what they started some time back. And like I said, Yangtze, which is the Asia's longest river, has virtually got dry last year. So, you're going to see in China alternate extreme floods and extreme droughts which are happening. I could go into many more things, but that's just to give you an idea. This is the fact. And these facts are not minor. We'll just go to it. Now, China has a huge problem in the north. It doesn't have enough water. So, it has embarked on a high profile, high investment, high risk water transfer infrastructure which has unknown outcomes besides being environmentally sustainable from south to north. They took water from south to north and the south is now facing droughts. So what's the use of this? They've spent money on this. The communists think that Chinese are great engineers, builders and constructors, but they are proving themselves to be poor visionaries in a hurry. Now, this is the World Bank report. This is the World Bank report on China which talks of country, climate, and development report. It's a very, very, very interesting report. Those of you who must see it, who can see it, must see it. Right? But the main thing is this. The main operative thing is this. This is a straight extract from the report. The impacts of climate change threaten China's densely populated and economically critical low-lying coastal cities, which are home to an estimated one-fifth of China's population and contribute a one-third of its GDP. So this is under risk. China already experiences frequent flo uh, coastal flooding, storm surges, coastal erosion, and saltwater intrusion. Unabated climate change could lead to estimated losses of between 0.5 and 2.3% 2 
as early as 2030, according to this report. Just think, today China is growing at just about 3 to 4 percent. If climate change strikes the way it is going to strike, what will China's GDP be? And it's going to be pretty bad. I'll prove it to you as we go along. And this is the uh, graphs, which they, this is again uh, extract from that report, which shows what will be the uh, quantum of impact of agriculture, disasters, health, temperature, and the com combination of all this. Change in the GDP, GDP is the left graph. Okay. Agriculture itself is going to lose anything up to 0.5 to 0.75 percent uh, of the GDP. And see the change in the income of the bottom 40 percent. If the income of the bottom 40 percent, just think, look, go back to what I spoke in consumption. If the income of the bottom 40 percent of the population, we are talking of 400 billion people, is going to go down by as much as 3 to 4 percent. Okay, or 10 percent, 5 percent in a year. Where will China they consume? If China doesn't consume, where will its economy go? See the cross connection between the two. Food security and all this is there. Okay, just this climate change, and this is not my imagination. This is a World Bank report. Okay, this is from South China Morning Post. He says, "Is China prepared for its?" warmer and wetter future. He says China will have longer heat waves, more floods and warmer seas this century. Climate scientists won. Who are these climate scientists? These are Chinese climate scientists. They know the problem. Yet, they are fooling everyone. Now, there is a Sydney-based research firm which says, which talks of gross domestic climate risk. Now, in this, he says half of China's GDP is at risk. And this corroborates with the World Bank report. And if you go into this, what the uh, Chinese research firm, I mean, the Sydney-based research firm says, you could, I mean, the picture is even worse. In fact, the World Bank has watered down that report politically the way I look at it. And the truth would be somewhere in between. And even if it is somewhere in between, it is damaging to China. Look at this. Last year, because of the heat waves, they didn't have water. And in the Yunnan Basin, where they had their major thermal plants, because they didn't have water to run their thermal plants, the production fell in 22. Just think energy. Without energy, how will your industry run? In fact, they had no energy even for ACs and all that were put off. Right? Okay. Now, the same thing in 2023, also the same thing comes. Economic recovery faces challenging summer. In this summer, when there were floods in the north, there were droughts in the south, where hydropower sizzles amid drought. There were droughts enough to cut their energy. So, you just look at the climate change, how it's already affecting. And I've just taken the figure of last two years. Actually, if you go into a little, do a little research, it has been affecting them for quite some time. Only thing is they don't talk about it. Okay. Climate change is, this is not pollution. Let me clarify it. We're not talking of pollution. I'm talking of core things where agriculture is going to get, their energy is going to get hit, people's livelihoods are going to get hit, their health is going to get hit. I'm looking at the larger picture. Xi Jinping himself says that Ukraine war has shown extreme importance of food security. Why? Because they were getting a whole lot of grain, etc. from Ukraine. And that has stopped. And now they're searching all around for getting, uh, you know, food grains. And now you look at it. I will talk about it later in the military aspect. Everyone says China will invade Taiwan. If China invades Taiwan, and there's a blockade of Taiwan by about two, three months. The Malacca Strait will close. That we can be rest assured. We'll discuss it in the next episode. Now, if that happens, China's food security will go for a toss completely. I mean, something which people don't understand. Okay. Now, look at this graph. This is a very, very, very 
you know, simple way of understanding the problem in uh, China. This graph shows the flooding in central and eastern China, right? In the period 1990 to 2018, this is the affected area in millions of hectares. Okay. Now look at this graph. This is the direct economic loss in billions of yuan from the, in the same period 1990 to 2018. Okay. Now let me superimpose both. See the thing. The thing here which people have to understand is. The area affected has gone down over years, but the damage has increased. Why? Development. You in de increase the development as development increases for the same amount of flooding, the same amount of heat waves, the damage is more, the losses are more. I mean, people have to understand this correlation. So you'll see that this all this caps Chinese gross national power. Okay, now the way I look at it, there is no way to turn the clock back. This is not an uncertain future, but a bleak future. As the PRC does not have the tools to cope with this change. In comparison, today when you go, you look at China, a lot of, so a lot of people talk of Japanification. Japanification, the way China puts it across, is only about demography. But when you look at demography, when you look at the ideological factor, because ideology is about power, when you look at the climate change, which is going to affect, and you come and the economic structure as a fallout of the ideology, Japanification will be a boon to China. They will cry for Japanification, it will not happen. Right. This is a short presentation relative to everything else. I have finished my presentation, sir. This is the thing. Well, now I would like you to ask questions and then we will take uh, questions from uh, people. Your views. Uh, thank, thank you so much, General Ravishankar. The first question that comes uh, in my mind is with so many problems, so many issues, why is Xi Jinping uh, trying adventurism in Arunachal area or Ladakh area or uh, in uh, Scarborough Shoals as well as in Taiwan? See, the thing is, People can say that you are externalizing the problem so you can divert the people's attention away from problems at home. General Ravi Shankar, this, when it comes to basic food, basic electricity, basic water, then they don't have time to look at, oh, yes, we are winning our war against India. Don't you think that it has come to that point now? Yes, you are right. Actually, this is the thing. We have to understand Chinese mentality in this. Till 2019, everyone thought, here is the next superpower. Xi Jinping was being welcomed everywhere like an you know, emperor. People said China has declined. Sorry, USA has declined. And China is going to replace USA. And it was accepted. That is why we have people like Pike, Michael Pillsbury who wrote 100 year marathon. And they were going to take over. People said they're, you know, the people with distant vision, they have long-term goals, the middle kingdom, all this nonsense. Even now, I find a lot of people talk like this. Till 2019, people didn't study China holistically. And we in India didn't study them at all. And they used this period to do a hocus focus on the whole world. They thought that we were very strong. They were very strong. And they could bulldoze us. And they did bulldoze us. When I talk about the military, you will understand how weak that military is and how strong our military is relatively. I'm not talking of the exact numbers of the guns and all that. That they have hell of a lot. Guns, missiles, rockets, all that nonsense. But the way they fight. Right? So, they are weak. So, we believed what the narratives they spun out. We believed their information war. They used everything to cast a spell on us. They used the BRI to project something great. And they took America for a ride, which is accepted even by people like Trump and Biden. After a little, Biden who said, they're having us our lunch there, isn't it? Or Marco Rubio who said, everything is going to China. 
so ipr theft everything so they built like maggots on all of us it is only from 2019 and 2020 when they tried all these stunts and they failed that people started studying china uh, to be very honest with you my study of china deepened during covid and i said look there's something more one has to learn about this country and i really spent a lot of time reading china and this is what comes out we didn't believe them even now our ignorance of china leads us to believe that china will come to arunachal if you remember the first time i came on your show i'm sorry i'm taking so much time but i want to explain this to people the first time you asked me when did you do that that was the time when they had come they were sitting in eastern ladakh and you said sir will you take a do the thing and i told you then that they'll not come back you remember that yes right that they will not come back and we will defeat them today they will never come back there might be a few small things but they'll never come back now because we know more about them we know their weaknesses we know that china is a hollow country and unless we start looking differently i'll turn around the question which you asked me why does xi jinping do all this why don't we feel that all this is showbiz or you know it's like the wolf which wants to huff and puff the down and it's the wolf which has you know chest uh, problems which we can't breathe out also so you look at it from that it's got it's full of bronchitis even hot air it can't blow that's the way i look at china um thank yeah. you sir uh, one one uh, clarification you said that yeah. uh, there is uh, too little or too much water i remember the last time there was flooding uh, there was a fear that the three gorges dam might break Would, and in order yes. to prevent that from breaking what they did was they went upstream and broke manually some yes. other dams yes so this is madness why are they trying to do something like this i mean If that that shows that their planning has gone or i what really do you think went wrong look what you said actually you 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 triggered something which uh, i thought i should not touch because of lack of time but we have time i'll trigger what you said is 100% thanks for uh, reminding me of that 100% right 2018 or 19 it was right uh, no 2028 it was yeah 2020 there were severe floods severe floods when the three gorges dam got filled and people felt that it's going to break they released all water and there was flooding downstream of yangtze river just think 2020 this is the case and upstream they broke five or six dams and released water as a result they lot of uh, uh, paddy cultivation went for a toss in the south okay this happens due to excessive rain in 2020 2022 there's drought in the same area yangtze river goes dry people started crossing the yangtze river on motorcycles okay there was there was no run off water also from the stream three gorges dam they didn't and yangtze river if you've been there you know is a navigable river yangtze basin is navigable and they all the factories and all are all around uh, uh, you know this uh, place where the bad start yeah. mm. the wuhan and all that okay so manufactured items go by ships and barges down the yangtze river to shanghai and get shipped out this year that couldn't happen last year they lost so one year they lose everything due to floods two years later they lose everything due to drought this year they've lost again to floods they've lost the complete north to floods agriculture and like i said in the past 140 years they have not had so many uh, so much floods and as they develop any small flood there is more damage so it limits your complete i mean no 
limits your complete gross national power. That's the point which we have to understand. And of course, like I said, they think they are visionaries by building all these dams and all that. But they are fools. Because, you know, the thing comes out, they have done everything fast. Saying, oh, we do it so fast, we build so much infrastructure, this, that, all that. But without knowing the consequences. Since they don't understand the consequences, they are going to be pretty severe as days go by. So you have to look at this whole story in this matrix of demography, ideology, economic structure and climate change. It affects everything else. If you look at climate change on its own, you might say that, okay, it'll, they'll go over. You know, when China talks, they talk of gross national power. Okay. I think it's high time you and I started talking of gross idiocy of China. <laughs> <laughs> gross national idiocy of China. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, General Ravi. I have one other follow-up question. And, yeah, and yeah. viewers, many of you have joined P Gurus or Ganeshad in the recent past. General and I have been talking about many things that were discussed for the first time on social media. That's what makes our channels unique. We don't hesitate to go in depth. One of the things that General Devashankar discussed, uh, you know, discussed was the river Brahmaputra itself and how China wanted to construct dam after dam on the Brahmaputra so that they could take the water from where? From the Himalayas all the way down to the plains. They believed that they had the engineering know-how to do these things. There is a quick update on this. Where, are, where do things stand now? So, yeah, as of now, on Brahmaputra, at the Great Bend, they're going ahead to the construction. But that construction is going to take a long time. Upstream, they've constructed about eight to nine dams. In fact, they're total of about 14, 13 to 14 dams which they have to construct. Eight to nine they have constructed because these exact figures are not known. And there's, uh, four are under construction, four or five are under construction. And there's a big dam at the Great Bend where... The, you know, Brahmaputra keeps coming along the Himalayas and then takes a turn and flows down into, you know, the plains of Assam. At that place, they are building a dam and because it's a gorge out there, you know, and so there you get a lot of water upstream. You can, it's a natural bondage. From that bondage, they want to tap water and take it down to the plains. Right. This is a program which is going to go for the next 15-20 years. It's not going to be done in a hurry. And till then, let us see if China can go through the way it is going through. Whether it will have the money also as things go by to invest in this is a question mark. The way I look at it. We will own the technology. And so one, last... earthquake in that area, one earthquake in that area could put paid to everything. Because they are doing it all in an earthquake prone area. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sir. I thought you were done. Um, yeah, yeah, next yeah, question. So there is something that is counterintuitive for me. You talked about gross ADSC value. Uh, this is where it is a little counterintuitive to me. China has food scarcity for which it needs to get things from Ukraine. Yet China is seen as being helping Russia, which in turn is waging a war against Ukraine, which becomes impossible for Ukraine to get out of that to get back to the normal stuff, which is to go back and be the wheat bowl of the world. So why this counterintuitive planning by the CCP? The CCP has done it basically to go against USA. You see, so I cut my he, nose? He, yeah. He's prepared to do it <laughs> because, see, the thing he's looking at alternate places by going to Africa, buying farmland and having you know, farm communes out there, which are contracted for China. He's gone to Cambodia for rice. He's gone to Latin America for whatever produce is there. Right? And he's struck a deal with Russia because Russia is not, Russia has also got grain. So he, he's gone to Russia to get this thing. So to a large extent, he feels that he can get out of the situation. But like I showed you that, uh, you know, thing, on Xi Jinping going all around for... I'll show that article again. Okay. Yeah, this... You know, he's been running after his scientists to produce food grains and to produce seeds. Yeah, can you imagine 
China is deficient in food technology, in grain technology, in making seeds technology. They get seeds from uh, seeds, food grain seeds. They get from the West. They don't have the technology to make their own grains. Or is there genetically modified stuff also? Yeah, they don't know. Can you? That you look. You everyone thinks no. Look, Shriya Yadji, yeah, you're laughing. I agree with you. You must laugh because this is a bloody joke, actually. Everyone thinks, you know, China is the biggest high-tech power and everything. I mean, I don't have it ready with me. But in the next program, I'll show you at least five articles of over the past three to four years where Xi Jinping has exonerated his scientists to produce seeds. And technology to produce seeds. They don't have this technology. They don't have seed technology. If they don't have seed technology, deserts are expanding. Coastal areas are getting flooded and that uh, thing is affected. They're, they are at food risk. In fact, in this time, India is better off. You are a net food exporter despite all this. Look, for one moment, I'm not saying that climate change won't hit it. It's going to hit everyone. It's going to hit everyone. But what the effect on China is going to be out of proportion than what we think normally. That is the point I'm trying to put across to all of you. I hope I've clarified the situation. Yes, you have, uh, General Ravi Shankar. And, and viewers, some of you may be wondering if there are 14 dams on the Brahmaputra, how does India still continue to get the water? Again, there was an episode that General Ravi Shankar said showing how this does not really impact India's downstream water flow. And, and you should go back and look at these things. These yeah. are jumps. These are jumps. I'm telling you in front of General Ravi Shankar, I'm telling him if these are jumps because nobody has taken the, the in-depth look to go and, you know, sift the grain from the chaff. We are not politicians. We are intellectuals, both uh, General Ravi Shankar and I. We think. We think and therefore we, you know, come up with these things. And General Ramshekar, one minor uh, clarification, sir. I think you said exonerated the scientists, but I think you meant exhorted the scientists. Yeah, exhorted. Yeah, not exonerated. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, exhorted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's my uh, slip of tongue. Right? In fact, just for uh, people's uh, uh, idea, there's this uh, video called Dams on Brahmaputra, which is there in Ganeshot. The same thing is there in Pigurus also, which I did earlier. You can see anywhere you want. Uh, have a look at it. People should not get worried about the dam which China is constructing on Brahmaputra because the Brahmaputra basin and the water in the Brahmaputra basin, 88% comes from our side. Only 12% comes from China. So if the 12% they can't stop all 12%. Even if the 12% reduces to 8 or 9%, it doesn't matter much. So really, things are under control. The problem is for China by doing this. We have to do some mitigating steps for other reasons, which I'll probably, we can have a revisit on that uh, yeah. you know, the presentation one of these days and we'll do it. Right? So I, uh, okay. So anything else? Otherwise, we could take some Questions one or... one last question because yeah, yeah, yeah. you please, explain please, please, please. It's, it's triggering more thought. A, a few months ago, India restricted the re-exportability of its food grains to many countries. I'll give you an example. UAE. Yeah. They said we give it to you, but you cannot re-export it to any other country. Yeah. Under that condition only we are doing it. I'm wondering if the net or the, the final recipient of this was China and India was trying to cut. Those rules. No, no, no. Thoughts, that I, let me explain to you. Uh, you know, we were doing a direct deal with China for export to China. And China didn't take it from us. Incidentally, that's the funny part. They didn't take it from us. Now, this re-export from UAE was to cut off Pakistan. Okay. One. Number two, our aim was to ensure that the food which we see what happened last year and for the past two years, the food which we've been exporting, we didn't have that kind of surplus in food uh, which we used to have the years before because we are also getting affected by climate change. So whatever reduced quantity which we could export, we still have uh, food surplus. We are a food surplus to export. To export, we wanted to ensure that it goes to those people who need it. 
to those it's countries who are actually we we have not made money out of it. We had to make money. We could have done deals with the Western world. That is why Europe was crying that you know India has stopped export to those people. We control the export to give it to poor people who didn't have food. Even if it meant we were not getting full money for it. And that is why we stopped US, UAE for re-export. Because, I mean, this is something which people don't know. Everything in Pakistan is Indian. Every item in Pakistan is Indian. With a UAE label. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's how it, because there's no direct trade between India and Pakistan. It goes via UAE. UAE makes money out of us. We make money out of us. And the poor Pakistanis suffer. I wouldn't say the poor Pakistanis, they've made to pay out through their nose. There's no, there's no love lost. We charge exorbitantly to UAE. UAE marks it up and gives that same exorbitant price to Pakistan. And Pakistan should realize that they're paying about three times or four times, which otherwise, with good relations, they, if they developed with us, they would have got it. Thank you, sir. In fact, uh, United States also is now suffering from not getting Sona Masuri rice uh, from yeah. India. And this ban has been in place for three, four months. We don't know when it is going to be lifted. Uh, it came very in a very all of a sudden. And uh, well, California grows its own long grain rice, quite not the same texture or taste as uh, what we get from India. But that's okay. These are all things that we have to evolve. One good thing that has happened from that is people are now eating much more of uh, you know, lentils or, or, or uh, yeah. guar, maize, other things, navadanyas and sirudanyas and other things. And uh, millets, for example, is becoming more popular. It's actually good for you. It uh, uh, there, there are people who can eat that and uh, not take medication even for their diabetes. Lots of good things about this. So anyway, yeah, 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 uh, so there, there are lots of things that are going on viewers. Now, sir, uh, let's go to some questions from our viewers. Yeah. Oh... Okay. So first, uh, Gumnami Baba says, excellent show today. Thanks a lot. We This is always an excellent show when we both get together. Okay. Uh, what will be the political future of China amid sacking of many top leaders? We'll talk of it down the line. Uh, don't yeah. worry. I'm just, I'm flagging. I'm not going to uh, take. What are the lessons for India? As we are seeing some percentage of manufacturing jobs are moving to India. If I'm correct, India has only 4% of world's fresh water. Industries need water. Ajay Nagendra, you brought out a fantastic question, to be very honest. This is the fact which we have to be cognizant of. I always keep saying, we should not become another China. We should be a better India. If we industrialize the way China is industrialized, we are going to have problems. We don't, we are a water deficient nation today. Unless we do a revolution in uh, and in our water planning, we shouldn't industrialize the way China is industrializing. And when people say, oh, China has so many industries, we don't have one, we are lagging or manufacturing is lagging, they don't know what they're talking. Okay, it is not enough. Ultimately, Remember, it is not important to be a very highly industrialized nation, but it is important that our people, the poorest man in our country, has two square meals in his stomach. It is more important that fellow is died, you know, saved from uh, poverty, he is saved with a, you know, from uh, hunger, rather than dying of pollution and lack of water, irrespective of how rich or poor you are. Okay. The, the, uh, the emphasis, uh, the emphasis on millets in the G20 conference. In fact, many of the meals served had a lot of millet-based, uh, uh, you know, recipes in them. This is a very important initiative because millets require less water. They make yeah. you less fat. They give you eat less, and this is how we used to live up until the British came along and made it. You know, okay. like you need to yeah, eat whatever. rice and wheat. <laughs> yeah. And look, viewers, we must be proud of our nation. I'm, I'm not making. We are, we are the biggest milk producer in the world. Operation Flood. We are biggest rice producer in the world. We export wheat, and this is a turnaround which has happened in the last 30, 40 years. I have lived through the time where I have had to go in Chennai, right, 
to stand in a queue for 2 to 3 hours to get Ration. 6 kg of rice ration yes yes me too me too yes yeah and we would get for a family of 6 to 7 people we would get no more than 2 kg of sugar okay and we could not get milk we could not get milk in this in this land of ours but today we are surplus for everything we are the biggest but other day i went to some place where they were giving all kinds of milk sweets right and i was saying and I, they were treating it as if it was dirt and i said yeah where where are we going okay we have to understand the uh, what we have traversed and that is the strength of our country general ravi shankar yeah. asked me how i became a morning person yeah yeah please tell me <laughs> tell me <laughs> so what used to happen was uh, general ravi shankar is spot on milk you didn't have these kind of now the way that milk is now giving in there was no sachet milk you had to go figure out where to get your own milk so we used to go to one of the uh, cow uh, cow herds who had like three or four buffaloes and there was a you know like 10 people would always go and uh, get their milk from them and and he would start milking around 5:30 in the morning and it was a good 20 minute walk and and i was like not even 10 years of age and my mom would wake me up at 5 o'clock run 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 whether my yeah, eyes yeah. are open or not i had to go quickly run and and bring it in that vessel make sure that nothing spills on the way back and and uh, we kept, the roads were not very great in those days it was it was something else guys these days we get so many things and so easy but there were times when middle class we are all middle class right we went we went through hell in the 70s my goodness i can't uh, Forget those days ever. So thanks, sir. Yeah, next question. I agree with you completely. Yeah, next comment is excellent study and analysis by General Sir and very useful for student. It's more than useful usefulness for students. You have to look at all this geopolitically, right? And we it's also important to formulate our uh, policies. As you mentioned, China was admired and respected here. However, there. they upset their apple cart by their unacceptable behavior thus waking up the world and specifically india i think the, the revolution in india about the knowledge of china has been uh, phenomenal in the past 2 to 3 years and we now understand that china is not as strong as it was thought in fact i feel it is weak uh, how will we counter economic dependence and its strategy to provide super cheap products at our local items why we are not economically dependent on anyone we have no problems really who said we are economically are you are we economically dependent uh, shri ji no no we we've kind of got a little complacent we need to go back and rediscover our manufacturing prowess we used to be very very good the ludhianas of the world the tirupur the coimbatore all these places have kind of slowed down because they said that we are not able to compete with china china was doing that because they were subsidizing the pro cost to capture market and they thought that once they have captured the market they can say, set any price they want but that itself is also shaky now india needs to go back why do you think prime minister keeps saying atmanirbharta atmanirbharta it is that is one yeah. of the important thing why do you think general ravi shankar spent the best part of his life uh, trying to make sure that ammunition is indigenous now you can't when there is a war you can't go asking for uh, this from others so sir you you answer the question yourself <laughs> yeah no no i he's right you're right what you're saying is right we are not economically dependent on anyone in fact we are the fastest growing economy and will remain this for quite some time and i this i credit to all of us all indians right it is the the power of this growth is not with any political personality it is not with any political party it is with us you and i as indians and we will do a show exclusively on the rise of india uh, maybe down the line maybe during diwali we can do this you know combine diwali yes, and rise absolutely of absolutely yeah right? let's let's do that yeah, yeah. okay and so a string of pearls a paper tiger or is it really countering india's maritime interest string of pearls was some effect say 4 4 years back today the first string has already fallen sri lanka is no more part of that string okay bangladesh is no more part of that string of pearls okay pakistan is a rotten pearl it's already falling off 
so you see nepal nepal is also not any more that happy with the bri and all that they have started coming towards us so you see that the string of pearls is now slowly going off right and to the extent i feel that china will not venture into the indian ocean region so fast in a hurry okay with so many dams on uh, brahmaputra cause more earthquake which endanger bharat and nepal yes there is a problem in this and uh, we have to take it up with nepal uh, not nepal with china uh, in this manner in all multinational forums and international forums it's something which india is not doing adequately that is my view okay uh, i will not take uh, questions which are of pakistan and all that we will stick to questions about uh, right uh, okay what about 3d printing technology that does not use water as much why are we not heavily investing in that technology right uh, let me put it across to you we are investing in this technology okay we are late on the thing but uh, we we are investing in this technology and i am very sure that we will uh, move ahead very fast in this direction i know it personally because uh, in iit we have people who are uh, focusing on this and researching this right so that is what it is i don't see any other questions unless you have any more quest this thing i'll uh, anything else you want to talk of no yeah. no sir this was fantastic uh, i think some of these things you may want to watch it one more time viewers because uh, we we move at a fairly fast pace it is like think of it like a, a lecture given in iit where the student is expected to absorb things that are coming oh, at a there fast are, pace there are some then... more questions have come up we'll take it okay go ahead go ahead sir yeah we'll take it so one question has come why is china building a canal across thailand to bypass strait of malacca how do you see the situation in terms of defense uh look that is the kra canal which uh, thailand uh, you know which china is trying to uh, build but thailand is not going to allow them for the simple reason it divides thailand into two parts okay and then the to control that kra canal china will come and sit on their head and the and thailand is in no mood to lose their sovereignty so i don't see this coming at all they'll talk of it they lot of ha who he will take on and that is the end of the story yeah i have there's only one question i thought there will be more so <laughs> yeah so, so uh, we do yeah, a, go ahead, sir. yeah yeah we do a program on the rise of india or we do the next part of this in during deepavali um you take a call then, yeah yeah we'll take a call sir no problem thank we'll you so much call. i think i'd like to see the response on this one viewers do send in your comments and i look at both channels ganeshot as well as p gurus to look at what you are thinking and see sometimes what happens is uh, we are also looking to you for constructive feedback on how to present this thing better we have a lot of things that we can do research on but it needs to be that everybody understands and benefits from this that is the whole point yeah a few more questions have come up let's take them does china have any originality or is it just copy pasting and reverse engineering usa idea for its own interest i think you should have a good better idea about this shriji yeah yes indeed saurabh um, in 2006 i think uh, i was jumping up and down with joy you know why because i got my first patent uh, issued in china that wow now i can you know got, i've got them now i can stop them copying my products and bringing them into the united states and and the liar, lawyer laughed at me he said why are you laughing he said you know the chinese jurist, uh, judiciary system is not what you think it should be even if you catch somebody red handed copying your technology the guy can just apologize to you in the court and that's all there is to it tomorrow he'll go to another place new company new name he'll start doing the same thing there are no uh, you know compensatory damages or preventive uh, pun punitive damages nothing of that sort so that was a humbling moment for me that there is no way uh, that anyone can stop them this is 2006 today we are in 2023 uh, 
Trump tried to fix this a little bit, but China doesn't want to talk about IPR because nothing they do, nothing they do is original, nothing. So it it will be another problem for them to even accept that they are copying, even though everybody knows they are copying. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, not only that, let me add. You see, this is a country which can't make its own seeds. Even we make better seeds. <laughs> right. this is all, there appears to be another global si supply chain crisis in the pipeline. Please advise India's peripheral for this. Look, uh, I don't think, I think we've got over it. We are not too dependent on China uh, for uh, certain things. Uh, we are dependent on China for many things, right? Our trade imbalance with China has gone up, there's no doubt. But they are primary items and it is one-to-one -one between India and China. I, and as it is, there are a lot of global uh, chain resupply or rather realignment of global supply chains happening. So it won't affect us. I don't think it will affect us the way it will affect other countries. The West is at risk. Uh, more importantly, where, you know, uh, where Sri Ayer is staying with his seven sisters and his background, <laughs> I think that place will have a problem. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Uh, is there a possibility of voyeurism by China or Long Island? Yes, there will be. That will always happen. They will try to look this side when we are also trying to look this side. So it's not a one-way street. Then is India prepared for the next global supply chain crisis? I've already said. Yeah. Uh, we, are, we are okay. I don't think we are in a problem. Okay. We talk of economy alone, but don't trust China is terrible. I think you made a very important point, uh, Rangaji. Uh, one of the fundamental problems of China is lack of trust. It does not generate trust in anyone. Don't you think so? Yes, yes. Uh, totally. Uh, very true. Totally. No one trusts China. Whatever little trust people had on China, I think uh, got washed away with the virus. There is no country in the world which trusts China, including North Korea and Pakistan. <laughs> even they don't trust China. Okay, That is why if you see in the past 2-3 years, even Pakistan for certain things has turned back towards USA. 3 years yes. back, if you saw the columns uh, you know, in uh, Pakistan newspapers, they were all for China. Today it is not so. They have turned. They are looking back towards USA. And of course, that's a different story. We'll talk of it. Okay. Everyone knows that Kalash Parvat and Mansour are in the name of India, but it is still under... Yeah, well, that's one of those things. Uh, historic and, uh, you know, because that was part of Tibet. Tibet went to China and that's where it is. In fact, we must start claiming that area back. Like they claim Arunachal Pradesh. We should also claim Kalash Parvat and Mansour and Trishul and all that. And say, look, this is historically and civilizationally part of India. So please give it back. So our exchange deal will be, you forget about uh, Arunachal, we'll, we'll forget about Mansarovar or something like that. But let us see how things go. Okay. Long way to go, General Ravishaka. Long, way, Long to way to go. Yes. Long way to go for all this. We have to, but basically we have to, you know, develop our own power and rise. And that is what uh, I think we need to discuss. Anything else? Uh, otherwise, we can... No, sir. I think we are done with it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, viewers, for coming and watching the show. Uh, for some of you, it might be a repetition if you've seen some of my old shows. But this is part of a series we are doing. By the end of this, when I... Uh, we will do the last... In the last one, I'll put all six together. And then you'll understand where China is. And take a call for yourself. So thanks a lot. Good evening. And thanks a lot, Sri Ayarji, for uh, you know joining me and hosting this show together. Right. Uh, we'll come back sooner or later on the next episode in the end of the 100-year marathon. Good evening and Jai Hind.